All right, folks, uh, thank you for joining today. We're having our rescheduled uh, webinar, Keeping Firms and Supply Chains Afloat in the Age of COVID-19. This is Anastasia De Santos with USAID's E3TRR. Um, I think some of you may have tried to join the previous iteration of the webinar, and we're trying a uh, simpler technology this time. Um, so we really look forward to a, a good discussion today. Um, just a quick logistics, please turn off your camera or um, turn off your video so that we can conserve bandwidth because I think that was a challenge last time. Um, actually, even us as speakers, we're not going to be using our cameras. Um, and then it, as we move through the presentations, um, there is a chat box. If you hover your cursor over the top right corner, you can see a sort of speaking bubble. And um, there are some new messages there. So that's where you can enter your questions uh, as you as they arise to you. Uh, we will certainly um, start the Q&A with the questions from last time. Um, so without any further ado, let me uh, just quickly explain again the topic for today and its importance um, in this age of COVID-19 and the pandemic affecting all of our host countries. Um, it really is the survival of the firms that's at stake. And, and these firms are very important to our host countries because of the essential goods and services that they provide, um, the tax revenue that they might pay to the government, even if they're not formal, they are paying um, other kinds of taxes and fees, such as sales tax and custom duties. Um, and of course, the wage employment that they provide to all their employees. So um, with that, I'm going to actually hand it over to my colleague, Sashi, to talk about how our agency is adapting some of our programming. Thanks, Anastasia. And I did give part of my presentation in the last session, so I've um, simplified it a little bit today. But just to provide a recap of what we are finding as a result, even though many countries are starting to open up um, after the initial impact of uh, COVID-19, we still have seen um, a significant loss of um, certain businesses and enterprises. Um, one study conducted by ACI Voca in Honduras showed that actually 15% of enterprises there closed permanently and 40% um, expect to close within three months if the situation didn't change. Um, additional data that we've gathered from Andy um, and uh, BFA Global show that 62% of, of small businesses are unable to deliver on existing orders and contracts due to logistical challenges that may have been caused by COVID. So even though we're now opening up, there's still um, the longer term effects of what's happened in the supply chain. And then 40% of businesses, small businesses um, have missed a financial payment. So this kind of highlights the, the challenge across the globe that we're facing, that uh, businesses are really facing a, a lack of liquidity and cash flow, and many only have about four weeks of cash reserve to, to survive. And what's interesting is that actually not a lot of money is needed in, in according to research to survive the crisis. It's, a, it's often a loan of less than $50,000 that would be needed to survive. Um, but this is coming at the same time that we're seeing um, a, a 25 to 40% drop in investment. And so while there is a need for relief capital, um, we're actually having a reduction in, in, in investment. And so as donors and as implementing partners, we're trying to think of ways to essentially provide immediate support. Um, and that can be in the form of flexible financing, non-financial support, or uh, direct financial support to capacity development organizations. And we're gonna go over a couple of those examples today, but I wanted to highlight one in India that was um, able to be designed at scale. This was being put together by our India mission with the government of India and the Indian Institute of Technology. Um, and when COVID hit in March, they were able to shift their discussions and, and think through how they could perhaps finance more innovations um, in the health space specifically. Um, and 
create essentially a platform, a market access platform um, of 21,000 public and private hospitals and clinics. They actually worked closely with the university and with independent lenders to create a syndicated loan facility, as well as a pooled grant fund. The pooled grant fund is actually based on funding from corporations, um, private sector companies in India. And USAID um, provided some of the seed fund to essentially structure the blended finance facility, as well as um, the syndicated loan facility to work with other lenders. This is just one example of, I think, how um, USAID and other donors are pivoting in, in terms of the post-COVID era and working together with other donors like both DFAT, DFID, and also um, development finance institutions like our new DFC and the CDC. Um, and not all interventions will target simply reaching um, producers of either PPEs or health uh, vaccines. We're also looking at ways to just support essentially those that have been most um, affected by the supply chain. Um, finally, we, we have examples from some of our missions like Haiti and Tunisia that are, are looking at ways to just support the serious cash flow challenges and provide advisory services, again, at scale um, by looking at, at pooling capital and working with other private sector partners in the, in the country uh, to essentially elongate loan terms to small businesses and find additional investment and essentially create um, somewhat of a pipeline for investors and essentially reduce the risk that um, investors are shying away from, from some of these countries. Um, another example from our colleagues from Feed the Future comes from um, their partnering for innovation program in which they were able to pivot and take um, milestones that had been missed by prior partners in order to continue supporting grants from 50 to 150,000 um, to continue operations for certain SMEs. Now you can imagine this is not a lot of funding. It, it was a, a total of, uh, I think, $1.2 million in funding uh, to support SMEs. But again, if um, across the board donors are, are able to pivot in this way, um, we will be able to at least mitigate some of the impact. And par part of that adaptation actually comes from communication with our partners. And so um, part of the discussion today is also for us to hear from you all um, what is needed and how we can better support you. And to actually view your USAID colleagues and your, your colleagues in the field um, working in this space as collaborators in, in responding and putting to the test our new procurement systems that are meant to be more adaptive. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleague Twi for a little bit more about how USAID Vietnam is, is working in this space. Twi? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Tha Thuy Nguyen. I'm with the Economic Growth and Governance Office of USAID Vietnam. It is my pleasure to share with you how USAID has helped Vietnamese businesses adapt to post-COVID supply chain realities. Despite sharing a land border with China where the coronavirus first emerged, Vietnam has reported only 340 cases and no death in a population of almost 100 million. It has not reported any new local cases in almost two months. Next slide, please. First, I would like to walk you through the challenges that Vietnamese uh, SMEs had to face even before COVID break out. Vietnamese SMEs account for 98. Oh, we are not seeing any slides. Mabu, can you help with the slides? Um, I think we can see some of them. I, 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 maybe it has to do with the, the screenshot that people are using, but it's pretty clear to me. You can continue. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I would ask that folks, please turn off your video. Um, it might be using up bandwidth, maybe. Okay, so again, first, um, 
I would like to walk you through the challenges that, that Vietnamese SME had to face even before the COVID breakout. Vietnamese SME account for 98% of total enterprises, 63% of employment, and 45% of GDP, but only 21% of SMEs are part of the global supply chains. In the meantime, FDI firms or lead firms account for 70% of Vietnamese exports. However, FDI firms often have their own foreign suppliers that are co-located in the same industrial zone. Processing and manufacturing are the two most attractive sectors among FDI firms in Vietnam. Moreover, the local content of Vietnamese SMEs export is low by regional and global standards because, first, lack of solid support industry supporting industries, second, low level of technology, and third, most SMEs cannot meet the FDI firm's requirements for quality and standards on goods and time delivery. Next slide, please. Now, COVID has impacted, how COVID has impacted Vietnamese SMEs. According to the Ministry of Planning and Investment, MPI, most Vietnamese SMEs have hibernated over the past four months under the impact of the COVID pandemic. They have had to face a double challenge, including lack of input materials and sharp decrease in export markets. The most affected sectors are garment and textile, footwear, electronics, and automobile. MPI also conducted a survey on almost 130,000 enterprises in mid-April 2020 and found that 80, 86% of them are negatively impacted by COVID. The bigger the scale of their business is, the more impact they get. Similarly, the Prime Minister's Private Sector Development Committee, PSDC, conducted a survey on more than 1,200 SMEs in early April 2020, and they also confirmed the same results. Next slide, please. Given the current status, Vietnamese SMEs have proactively adopted a number of measures to cope with COVID. The most popular ones, including reducing staff, reducing production costs, looking for new markets or focusing on product on domestic markets, reducing sales price and even closing production temporarily. However, almost 20% of SMEs have no solutions. That means they do not know what to do. Next slide, please. The Vietnamese government has conducted many consultation sessions with the businesses. Most of them are online or virtual meetings to seek their recommendations to improve the situation. Typically, are you okay with the slides? Typically, on May 9, the Prime Minister had an online conference with businesses nationwide. Virtually joining him are local authorities from 63 provinces and 30 ministries. Most businesses recommend reducing tax obligations, extending deadlines for tax payments, and reducing interest rates. The government of Vietnam has adopted some of these recommendations. In addition, the government has rolled out a 62 trillion Vietnamese dong, equivalent to 2.6 billion US dollars package to support post-COVID business recovery. Slide 12. Next slide, slide number 12. In late April 2020, the U.S. government, through USA, committed $5 million in economic support funds to mitigate the impact of the COVID pandemic on the Vietnamese economy. The funds will support USA links SME project to bring much-needed resources to the private sector's recovery by first enhancing access to finance for businesses. Second, improving business support organizations, BSOs. And third, partnering with the government of Vietnam 
towards the relief efforts. Links SME has worked with its government agencies to develop a post-COVID action plan, which includes three phases, stabilization, adaptation, and recovery, with the time frames reflected on the 12th slide. Next slide, please, slide number 13. Links SME is structured under three components, policy reforms, government to business interactions and business to business linkages. Under component number one, Links SME co collaborate with the Vietnamese government agencies led by the Office of the Government to review recently issued policies and regulations in order to propose corrective solutions propose solutions to improve effectiveness in state governance and study the trend of investment flows to propose policies to support businesses engage in a new in new value chains next slide slide number 14 under component number 2 links sme conducts research to recommend a pilot digital administrative procedure reform to improve government to business interactions this is a continuation of the vietnamese government effort with the recent launch of the national public service portal an electronic platform to connect the government with people and enterprises the portal has offered almost 300 services for businesses which save a lot of time and money for businesses. These two photos were taken at a recent consultation session between the government and the businesses that links SME provided support. Next slide, slide number 13. Links SME also focuses its support on component number three of business to business linkages. Under stabilization, Link SME collaborates with BSOs to support businesses in their restructuring efforts in production models and financial resources. It will help improve and roll out the SME care tool to upgrade the performance of SMEs. It will also support the establishment of Vietnam Mentoring Network to provide tailor-made coaching services to SMEs. Next slide, slide number 16. Under adaptation, Links SME develops a training system including online training for SMEs. It works with Vietnam Mentoring Network and BSOs to embed experts to SMEs. Given the complicated pandemic situation, digital transformation is an urgent requirement for any business. Links SME support SMEs in this transition process. Uh, VMN, it is a Vietnam Mentoring Network. Links SME also works with SMEs and BSO to renegotiate lending terms, restructure debt, and explore and promote innovative financial services for SMEs to give them some breathing room for better participation in supply chains. Next slide, slide number seven, number 17. Under the recovery phase, Links SME will conduct experience sharing workshops among CEOs of lead firms and SMEs to promote the information exchange as well as business matching opportunities. As most manufacturing SMEs currently face the shortage in input materials and the decrease in export markets, Link's SME will call for innovative ideas of new value chains and sustainable ecosystems. And over the past few months, business imaging sessions have become a new practice, and this will be replicated in the future. Next slide, slide number 18. Given the COVID 
Since the pandemic, many garment and textile companies in Vietnam have reoriented their products to personal protective equipment (PPE). In this photo, the Made in Vietnam isolation gowns produced by Viet Thanh Garment Company are on their way to the U.S. on April 22nd, 2020. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and back to you, Shashi and Anes Asia. Thank you, Tui. Um, I think we'll move over to our colleague Yasin Simbori from our partner INP. Thank you, Sashi. Hello, everyone. So my name is Yasin Simbori, and I currently work for INP, investor and partner. Uh, which is an impact investing firm uh, that is dedicated to supporting uh, African entrepreneurs across the continent. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, uh, the type of challenges that our portfolio companies have experienced since uh, the COVID-19 crisis and the type of solutions that we came up with in order to help them face the, the current situation. Uh, but before I'm jumping into that, I wanted to give you um, a brief uh, overview of who we are and uh, the type of work that we've been doing with uh, USAID over the past, uh, the past two years. Um, so in a nutshell, INP uh, stands for Investor and Partner. It is a pioneering impact investing firm um, that is dedicated to provide adapted financial solutions to, um, to ent African entrepreneurs across the continent. Um, we focus on what we call um, the, the missing middle, meaning enterprises that have uh, uh, a financing needs between 10,000 euros to 3 million euros. And usually uh, these type of enterprises are uh, either too young or too risky to attract uh, uh, financing from, uh, from uh, traditional uh, financial institutions. So um, our mandate is to intervene uh, with, uh, with this type of enterprises and to support them at different level of, uh, of, the, um, of the ma their maturity. And we are doing this uh, with uh, three type of uh, investment vehicles that we have launched over the past, uh, the past three years. Um, so next slide, please. Over the past, uh, the past two years, we have partnered with uh, USAID in order to develop a program that is called the PACE Partnership to Accelerate Entrep uh, Entrepreneurship. Um, and so we focused on, uh, on the Sahel region, mainly on Burkina Faso, Niger, and Senegal, um, because it is where in the Sahel, where in, uh, in West Africa, actually, uh, the, the ecosystem is still poorly developed and uh, where early stage enterprises are still struggling to, act, to have access to financing and technical support uh, in order to, to start or to accelerate their business. So the purpose of uh, the grant that we received from USAID was to um, provide some recoverable grants uh, to high potential early stage enterprises. Uh, combining it, it was also to combine the seed funding with uh, some coaching uh, by, and also organizing some peer learning events, et cetera, in order to help these enterprises maximize their chances uh, to, uh, to obtain additional financing after the end of um, the acceleration uh, program. And so today uh, we, have, uh, we have financed about uh, 24 uh, SGBs uh, that have been able to create or to maintain uh, 108 jobs. Um, most of uh, these enterprises are currently uh, run by women. And it's also interesting to see that uh, about um, um, a year after the, the program, uh, most of uh, the SMEs are observing an average revenue growth of about 41%. And finally, um, we at this stage, five SMEs that we are supporting uh, have already um, uh, raised some additional financing from, uh, from other uh, financial institutions. So this proves that uh, with the necessary seed funding, the necessary coaching, um, even the the, yeah, the the most early um, enterprises in uh, the uh, the most fragile uh, parts in uh, on the continent can have access to um, to the necessary financing in order to continue growing. Uh, but this, despite this uh, this performance, uh, we uh, we know that over the past uh, the past three months actually, um, most of our portfolio companies have been. Uh, uh, experiencing a few challenges uh, due to the COVID-19. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? 
And, and so we, we did an initial assessment in order to, to, uh, to identify the type, of, type of, um, of difficulties, the type of challenges that our portfolio companies were, were experiencing. And um, the first result of uh, this assessment, assessment showed that half of, of our uh, portfolio companies were facing a high level of risk, with uh, most of them facing a very significant loss of revenue, about 25%, in, um, in some sectors that were uh, highly exposed to the, to the current crisis, such as the textile sector, the education sector, some, um, some companies in the agro, um, agribusiness sector also. And as a result of, uh, of uh, this decline in revenue, uh, some of them have, are currently experiencing some uh, fragile cash situation. And uh, as a cost consequence, they had to, uh, to lay off uh, part of, um, of, uh, of their staff. And so we observe about 20% um, of, uh, of their staff that have been put on temporary unemployment over the past three months. However, on the overall of our portfolio, we see that uh, some companies are facing uh, moderate or low risk, depending on their sectors and also depending on their activity. Uh, we observe that some companies have been able to, com to continue their activity by working uh, remotely, by reorganizing their production uh, processes, and therefore they have um, been um, uh, facing only moderate loss of revenue. We also have some, uh, some companies that have been able to uh, uh, see this crisis as an opportunity to, to, to continue innovating and to adapt and transform their, their business models. It is typically the case for uh, enterprises in the, uh, the education sector, uh, such as schools that have decided to, um, uh, to digitalize more their learning content. Uh, and other uh, companies, for example, in the rain, uh, retail sector that have uh, been using the digital tools in order to, uh, to reach other type of, uh, of clients. Um, but to, to support the most fragile uh, enterprises in, the, in this context, we came up with um, different uh, solutions at uh, two different levels. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so first of all, at the INP and at the PACE portfolio level, we came up with a free punch solution in order to help uh, these enterprises. And uh, so this solution are comprised, comprised of uh, firstly providing strategic coaching in order to support these enterprises to repurpose their business models, to um, continue innovating uh, in their offer and processes in general. And this is accessible to all our portfolio companies. In addition to this strategic uh, coaching, uh, we noticed that uh, some of the, our portfolio companies were also um, uh, um, in need of additional financing in order to uh, repurpose their, their business models. So we have been able to, um, to repurpose our uh, grant with uh, that, the grant that we are managing with, uh, with the PACE program and other grant that we are managing with uh, some other donors in order to be able to provide some financial, some follow-on financing to these type of enterprises that needed to invest in uh, additional capex, that needed uh, additional working capital, et cetera. And uh, finally, uh, we have been able also, and we are currently actually developing uh, some uh, digital trainings program uh, that have been tried and tested among uh, several entrepreneurs. And, uh, and the purpose of this training will be um, to help uh, our portfolio entrep enterprises to, um, uh, to face the current crisis, to adopt the, the right behaviors, actions, et cetera, um, and to be able also to, to anticipate for, for potential future crisis. And of course, this, uh, this um, uh, type of technical assistance will be uh, uh, um, available to our portfolio uh, SGBs. At a larger scale, um, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? At a larger scale, we, uh, we have decided to launch a, a relief fund uh, that, will, that will target not only our, specifically our uh, portfolio companies, but uh, at a larger level, uh, over enterprises uh, across uh, African fragile countries. Uh, that may need uh, some uh, support and some um, additional financing to face this crisis and to face the, the coming economic uh, turnaround. Uh, so we are uh, launching, we are raising a 20 million euro relief fund, um, mainly from donors and uh, from other private um, uh, 
on, from, from corporates also with complementary uh, strategies. And the purpose of this fund will be to provide some uh, flexible financial instruments to high potential um, uh, enterprises, uh, providing, for example, interest-free and collateral-free loans uh, from amounts uh, raising to um, uh, ranging from 20,000 USD to 300,000 USD um, in order to finance some uh, capex need, working capital needs. Um, for enterprises that are more mature and that uh, might need um, um, an amount higher than 300,000 USD, uh, we might be able also with this uh, fund to provide some interest-bearing loans in uh, very few cases. And uh, finally, uh, uh, a key characteristic, a key component of this fund will be to, uh, to improve the resilience of uh, the enterprises. Uh, by providing some uh, tailored uh, technical assistance, uh, advisory services um, to help the, the company face, um, to, to adapt uh, the right behaviors in, uh, in the context of, uh, of crisis. So this is in a nutshell what we are doing um, first, first of all at our portfolio level and at a larger scale because we believe that um, it is important not to only react to the, uh, the, to, um, uh, the current context by finding emergency measures. It's also very important to be able to um, uh, rethink our financial instru instruments, our uh, supporting approaches in order to uh, anticipate for, for future crisis. Um, so yes, this is uh, what we're doing in a nutshell. So I'm available to answer any question after that. Thank you. Thank you, Yassine, and, and thank you to Tui. Um, just for everyone's sake, I would like to um, pose a couple of questions that came about in our last session two weeks ago that we were unable to answer due to our technology glitch. Um, I'll ask those questions first, uh, and then we'll move, proceed with some of the questions that you might have for our speakers today. Please include those into the chat box on the right-hand side. We are logging them. So the first question actually, um, first two questions are for Yassine. Um, we were wondering if you could share a little bit more about the West African small growing businesses in terms of if you have reports on them. And then if you could give some examples of the digital tools um, that were used and how the SGBs adopted them to mitigate COVID-19 impacts. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you for, for these questions. Um, so yeah, most of our um, reports and resources are currently available on, uh, on our website where we uh, reference uh, most of our investments and uh, the SDBs that we have been supporting through the PACE program and through um, our other uh, investment vehicles. So please feel free to, uh, to go on our website. I can add the link uh, maybe on the, on the chat, uh, chat box if necessary. And um, as for the digital, uh, the use of digital tools, um, um, it's um, it was actually mainly used in some uh, in some sectors. Uh, as I was saying, we have uh, some companies in the education sector. Uh, let's say we have some private schools that we have financed, and we also have some companies uh, whose well, whose main activity actually are to provide services to private and uh, public schools. And uh, over the past months, their activities have been uh, have been slowed down, given the close, closing of most school most schools in uh, in West Africa. So um, they have decided to uh, to uh, develop uh, more detailed uh, learning content um, and uh, to digitalize these uh, these content in order to uh, to ensure uh, the continuity of uh, of their learning programs. So there are a lot of uh, e-learning programs. Um, that have been uh, uh, that our portfolio companies in the education sector have been uh, developing over the past uh, the past few months. In the retail sector, we also observe uh, some companies um, that um, relied on um, physical shops actually to sell their, their their products before the COVID crisis. And since the crisis, they are, they have asked for our uh, support in order to reinforce their online uh, presence uh, by developing some uh, e-commerce platforms, etc. So uh, the, technic the use of technic technological uh, tools, technology tools, um, are very um, uh, important to, uh, to help uh, mitigate the impact of, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis. But uh, we cannot, um, it really depends on the sector because on uh, some uh, traditional sectors such as uh, uh, 
uh, agribusiness or manufacturing sectors, it might be more challenging actually to, to use it as a mitigating, uh, mitigating um, uh, solution. Thank you, Yasin. Um, and, I, and just to mention, I know some of the digital tools that you're developing are with partners of USAID as well. And so as those tools are available, um, we will try to post them on our various websites. But um, if we have the one from AMI available, Yasin, that'd be great to share that with the larger group today. Um, so another question that is from um, the larger group, but maybe Anastasia, you can take this, is about what we're seeing overall in terms of aggregation. Um, is all of this just a drop in the bucket? And are we having any significant impact as presumably thousands of SMEs go out of business or lay off staff? Thanks, Ashi. Um, I, I uh, opened my camera up. I hope it doesn't tank everything. So uh, that, that's an excellent question. I didn't see Kurt online, but I do see many food security colleagues. So um, of course, this is a burning question that we're all facing. Um, I'm sure you all are aware of many different trackers of the impact of different um, of the pandemic in different countries. Uh, OECD and IMF are just some of those institutions providing those. And then we also have some early uh, collections of solutions, for example, from the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development. I just posted a, that link as an example in the chat. In terms of evidence, um, we do have uh, sort of previously published USAID guidance on how to grow firms, how to support them and maintain their employment. And I'm just posting two of those, uh, the USAID employment framework and also our last year's um, small and medium enterprise evidence review. Of course, that's sort of very last year now and, and none of it necessarily applies in the pandemic context. So, um, and now we need to acknowledge, as Kurt said, that the scale of the problem is massive. And some, maybe even most firms, depending on the sector, like tourism or any kind of personal service, is we have to accept that most of them are not going to survive or they depend on um, in-person transactions. So we need to carefully consider how we're going to use our scarce resources. Um, we can't save everyone and we shouldn't save everyone. So on this important question, um, I'm, I apologize, this is an internal USAID Economic Growth Sector Council webinar, but we will have a webinar on July 9 featuring some World Bank research. And this is public research, so you can always explore it on your own. I'm going to try to copy and paste the links right now. So the first one is a paper just using kind of old evidence, uh, old data from firms, but to see where their financial and cash balance standing is. And basically, it shows that firms of any size, no matter how healthy and large they were, may have leveraged themselves a lot. And then, of course, this pandemic caught them off guard and any size burn might be equally likely to crash and burn right now. And then uh, any size firm. And then the second link um, from the enterprise surveys, um, there is a very early results from just Moldova of their pulse surveys, which primarily look at the impact of the pandemic on different firms. And then the reception of government assistance, whether they even got any government assistance and what they're expecting towards there. So for example, in Moldova, 16% of all firms that they surveyed pretty early on have permanently closed and only 1% have received any government assistance at the time of the survey. And they're gonna be putting out more data very soon and we'll have that internal webinar to talk about it. I think all this really shows that besides some of the interventions we're talking about today, they are important to, to look at those uh, adapters and those survivors that we should be helping. Um, we also need to think about the systemic issues and, and um, structural barriers whoops, that um, affect all firms and make sure that we're addressing those as well. And I, I don't know, Sashi, if you wanted to add anything to that. No, I, I think that's completely true. In terms of the finance sector, um, we we had a couple of examples that I shared, you know, from India, and I think even Yasin's example of the relief fund is a good one. Um, but what we're seeing is that if it's not coupled with support on the policy front or even well planning with the government, we can cause um, 
some challenges for how relief is provided. And there was a recent article that showed in Peru, cases have actually spiked 80 days after the lockdown as a result of people rushing to the banks and markets with um, some of the government cash transfers. And so this speaks to the, the structural barriers of financial access that have always existed, but in this case um, have to be taken into account before solutions are provided um, in order to, to prevent um, what's happened now in Peru, which is essentially um, a, a, a spike much, much, much later than, than the government had planned for. Um, and, and so continuing with some of the questions that, that I know you were, 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 we don't have as much time today to get through everything, but maybe Twi, you could share a little bit about how your program is also working in supporting um, some of the, the, the businesses in responding to the U.S. Thank you, uh, Sarsi. Uh, for the first uh, question, uh, who sets up the Vietnam Mentoring Network? This network uh, is established by our Vietnamese government counterpart, uh, the Agency for Enterprise Development. It is quite an open network, and it consists of the experts who can provide coaching, uh, capacity building services to uh, business support organizations, BSOs as well as uh, SMEs. Um, and the second question uh, of uh, the survey is, is a very popular tool for in Vietnam nowadays. And, and for any surveys, we in collaboration with our counterparts, we try to combine both open-ended questions and multiple choice questions. The third question and how uh, we targeted firms to benefits and link them to the demand in the US. So we support, uh, we try to promote uh, the linkages between SMEs and lead firms through two uh, channels. First, we work through the BSOs, business support organizations, who has a strong network of SMEs in the country, and uh, they also have a, a database of lead firms either in the US or other countries. And over the past few months, they, uh, I think, have had initial success with uh, expanding their uh, database with lead firms, international or foreign lead firms. Another channel is Links SME also work very closely with our government counterparts uh, to uh, organize business e-matching events. For example, they collaborate with foreign commercial service uh, of uh, Vietnam in the US or other way of the US in Vietnam uh, to promote uh, business matching, e matching opportunities for SMEs and lead firms so that they can meet with each other and um, uh, continue to the um, assessment so that they can uh, develop linkages. Thank you, Chen. Okay, so, thank you. Um, so and I'm going to go back to a couple of questions to Yasin if, if possible. Um, Yasin, questions that came up from our prior session included if you can share some of what you're doing in terms of the coaching based on the most common demands and how willing the businesses are to adopt the behavior change to cope with the current context and then secondly in terms of the relief grants you mentioned if you could share the criteria you're using Definitely no problem. Um, so the type of needs that were mostly common um, over the past months was to um, um, to help actually the entrepreneurs to better manage their, their cash positions, um, to identify quick wins, quick ways to reduce uh, their costs. Uh, so managing liquidity was the, the most urgent actually over the past months. Uh, so there was a, a lot of support that was uh, provided in that in that. Um, in these um, in these areas, um, so it, generally, actually, um, entrepreneurs come to us with um, with uh, some solutions that they have already identified themselves, 
and they want to test them with us and they want to uh, want us to help them implement them and assess the feasibility of uh, most of the, 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 the measures that they are thinking about. So our role is to help them, uh, to guide them actually uh, in, the, um, in choosing the, the best options and how to, to implement uh, these type of measures. So usually uh, there, is no, there, there is no actually no opposition um, uh, in, uh, in adapting any change that, uh, that are necessary to, uh, to face the current crisis. Uh, there is no um, top-down approach when when coaching this type of uh, this type of entrepreneurs, and uh, they propose things, and we we uh, guide them to the best options that we think might be uh, most relevant to to their activity and their their sector in general. Um, the second question was about the criteria of the relief fund, right? Yeah, exactly. The relief grants and and uh, the how you're selecting your SGBs. Yes. Um, so about the, the relief fund, so um, at this stage, what we are doing uh, in order to uh, provide some emergency uh, financing to uh, our portfolio companies, uh, we are repurposing using um, part of the grants that we received from, uh, from USAID and from other donors in order to support uh, our portfolio companies. But given our um, limited resources, we need to prioritize some businesses. And we will focus, for example, on enterprises that have no, no other option of, uh, of financing. Uh, we'll prioritize uh, enterprises uh, that had um, a good performance be before the COVID crisis to make sure that uh, the additional financing that we provide will be uh, used to, um, to address the fragil fragilities that were caused by the current crisis and not uh, used to cure uh, prior uh, fragil fragilities. Um, we will also, um, for most of uh, the enterprises that are part of our portfolio that have benefited from, uh, from, uh, from grants, uh, reimbursable grants, we'll assess their uh, reimbursement uh, track record. And uh, the last uh, criteria will be also on the, the, the sectors of uh, these enterprises because we'll focus on sectors that have been uh, mostly uh, exposed to the current crisis, such as the tourism sector, the education sector, some activity in the agro-business agro sector, um, and uh, some companies also in the retail sector. Great, thank you. Um, and just to mention, I think uh, an important point that we wanted to highlight in today's seminar is that um, with the new program income waiver that USAID has permitted, we are able to provide a little bit more easily um, this type of relief capital that, that yes, we discussed, because we're essentially able to provide um, grants that can be repurposed for um, loans and or uh, with zero interest. Uh, a question for Twi, actually, this is a, a good question because I know there's been a lot of um, antidotal evidence that the crisis has particularly been severe for um, women as a result of uh, the burden of child and elderly care. Could you speak to how you're addressing constraints to women and youth? Thank you for the question. Actually, Lynx SMB is not uh, specifically uh, designed for women-owned businesses. We are going to launch another uh, new project that will focus more on women. But um, given the current situation, we have been approached by the Vietnam uh, Women Entrepreneurs Council. Uh, part, uh, they are a branch under the Vietnam uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, VCCI, and uh, we are going to uh, conduct a series of training during the summer to improve the capacity for women-owned businesses. And we also um, helped them to organize an exhibition to promote their products. So this is something we designed specifically for uh, women own small businesses under Links SME project. Thank you, um, Tui. And I think the next question is back to Yasin. Yasin, um, if you could share a little bit about how INP addresses the demands and challenges in the market 
um, in terms of COVID, and then also a little bit about how the relief fund will evolve to a more permanent SPV. Yes, of course. Uh, so on the demand side, uh, depending on the, on the sectors, uh, we observe different things. Um, for example, um, when looking at enterprises, uh, which main purpose is to provide some essential goods and, uh, and services, uh, the, the demand was slightly lower, uh, but not significantly, actually. Uh, most of the, the enterprises, for example, in the, uh, the food and beverage sector only faced uh, moderate um, loss of revenue over the past, uh, the past few months. Um, but uh, when looking at other enterprises that um, uh, sometimes propose more sophisticated uh, uh, products, uh, they have um, they uh, th their demand, of course, was um, was slightly uh, has a, has been uh, significantly reduced over the past month. So, our role was to help these type of enterprises to diversify a little bit their the activity in the coming months. Uh, and to focus on uh, on type of goods and services that are needed immediately in the context of uh, of, the, of the crisis, for example, um, some companies in uh, in, uh, in Senegal and also in in, um, in Burkina that are really um, showing uh, very good results over the in the in the context of the PACE program. Uh, they have they are operating in the cosmetics sector, producing essential oils, uh, perfumes, etc. And uh, since the beginning of the crisis, they had to uh, close some of, uh, of, the, of, their, of their shops temporarily. And they have decided actually to uh, refocus their businesses on producing some um, um, hydro alcohol. I, I don't know how to say that in English, but uh, um, antiseptic gels, uh, soaps and uh, sanitizers, etc in order to, uh, yeah, to address the, the, the immediate need on the, um, on the, on the market. And uh, by doing that, they have been able to, 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 um, to have some cash inflows to face their, their current uh, uh, um, expenses. Um, and on the second question about um, the duration of, um, of the relief fund, so we are targeting um, a it's uh, it's the, the fund actually is uh, currently uh, uh, being designed by by our team. It's uh, under discussion with uh, our potential partners, but the purpose of it is to have a fund of uh, about uh, four years of uh, duration, with uh, three years uh, that will be uh, dedicated to uh, disperse uh, the funds that will be um, that will be uh, um, that we will raise actually. And having a one year, uh, for example, to be to recover the, the grants that we provide uh, to the uh, to the SMEs. So the overall purpose of, of this fund is to um, provide the recoverable grants to uh, to the SMEs that will need it, and um, to recycle every uh, the reimbursement of, uh, of that we will receive to be able to finance uh, future needs of other enterprises in the context of uh, of crisis. Great. Thank you so much, Yassine. I think that closes the questions that we've received today. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to write them into the chat box and we'll try to answer them. If everyone could also take a quick survey of today's webinar, we appreciate those of you who could join again today. I know it was um, a little difficult given last last the last session and the technology glitches, so we appreciate those of you who are able to join once again today. And if you have additional questions, do feel free to also um, reach out to any of us uh, via email. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day, wherever you are. <laughs>